Well, hello everybody. It's Martin Keenan here with uh, this week's Infection Control Matters podcast. I'm delighted to say Phil Russo is joining me from Melbourne. Hi, Phil. G'day, man. Good to see you. And our special guest today is Professor Michael Borge from the University of Malta, but also the Department of Infection Prevention and Control at the Mata Day Hospital. And we're going to be talking about MRSA. Now, I can remember hearing Michael talk about MRSA about the time of my 18th birthday, I think. Uh, so he's been working on this one for quite some time. So uh, welcome, Michael, because you've just published a nice paper recently in ASHI, which is open access, so we can give everybody access to it. Nice to see you. Same here. Thanks for the invite, Martin. Can you take us back in time then, uh, you know, because I've, I've heard you talk about how MRSA was endemic in Malta and what you've done about it over a period of time because it's a nice paper looking at a series of interventions that have obviously made an enormous impact uh, on MRSA bloodstream infections. Yeah, so basically in a nutshell, as you said, I am currently uh, the head of infection prevention here at Mater Dei. Uh, Mater Dei was inaugurated in 2007 and before that we were at an older hospital literally down the road called St. Luke's. And from the mid-90s, we started to have major issues with MRSA bacteremias with significant patient morbidity and mortality. And uh, despite moving to a brand new hospital from our previous Nightingale-style 1940s design to relatively modern wards, our MRSA did not really change. If if anything, it, it was even worse. And then in the early 10s, obviously like most other hospitals in, in the world, you know, we bought into the um, clean, uh, cleaner care is a safer care uh, approach and mm-hmm. we implemented the WHO recommendations in terms of uh, advocating for better alcohol rub use, uh, making forms available. And most of this was focused and we had a very strong focus on auditing with truly people employed to do this almost full time at the start and then moving to a half time basis and doing lots of feedback and uh, sort of meetings with the lower performing entities uh, trying to either cajole or, or sometimes even coerce uh, some improvement and things improved um, as, as we show in the paper you know and we used that core up uh, consumption as our as our outcome indicator and and things improved remarkably. So you switched from direct observation to alcohol hand rub consumption as a measure. And we published a very short letter a few years ago, actually showing that the alcohol rub surveillance and our visual observation um, correlated quite well. And the reason we used both uh, was more in terms of behavior change and this is the two words that continuously come up in 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 our publication because as you know i'm pretty convinced that that our area is more of a behavior science than it is a medical science but that's maybe another story (laughs) so uh yeah so we still used a lot of visual observations and the reason is what we found was when we went with alcohol rub um uh, data it was very difficult to to actually get this, I wouldn't say accepted, but even understood, you know, and uh, you'd used to get some very interesting replies. Well, how do you know that our alcohol rub is best than the others? I'm pretty sure they're using it for mattresses, etc. So in terms of convincing and motivation, we found that the observation data was more relevant, especially for the nursing profession in our hospital. So we used both and therefore used the, the two data sets to collaborate each other. So if we had uh, areas where we had very hard or up and then observation wise, it didn't really match. Then we looked into that and see what happens, what's happening. And in fact, yes, there was some that when you'd find some very interesting uses for alcohol hand rub. <laughs> which were to be, be wasteful and, and costly. So there was that that element there. Yeah, can, can I just ask what sort of feedback? What sort of feedback were you providing to those to those staff with that consumption use and and the um and the compliance with hand touching? Yeah. So basically, what we do, as I said, Phil. I mean, most of our feedback 
it relates to the observation and um, uh, audits. Uh, we do give them the Rako Horn up once a year, but they're not really interested in it. Uh, but they are very much interested in, in the observations. Right. Uh, because they see a much more clinical relevance to them than, than maybe the alcohol. Sure. Uh, so basically at the end of the ward visit, the the person who does the observation, as I said, you know, we actually employ uh, someone specifically for this, and she's very well trained, and obviously because she does so many She's, she's quite reliable in, 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 in her interpretation. Uh, so at the end of the visit, she does an informal um, uh, feedback to the charge nurse, the nurse in charge of the ward or whoever is there at the moment. Um, and then uh, six monthly, we send them a two-pager, no more than that, because they were very clear, you know, don't give us um uh, dissertations please you know so we just not not too much to read um, uh, uh, and if i must be honest and martin knows this because um, i had a very interesting program in ips a few years ago we primarily focus on the first moment um and one of the reasons for that was that you know when we were starting to do focus groups with them we still push the five moments obviously we still include it in our education but what we found was that if we look at the first moment, most of the other moments follow it. You know, so uh, when we had a a campaign, when when we shifted our campaign, primarily focused on the first moment, then the other moments from the visual observations followed it or followed the trends quite quite well. So in terms of social marketing, you know, we wanted to keep it simple. We were very uh, apprehensive of um, uh, people confusing uh, the the messaging, so we stuck almost exclusively to the first moment. And uh, again, we've seen that that this correlates very well then with, with other moments. I do, I do remember that very well. Unfortunately, Professor Pite was daft enough to take you on in a in a debate where he was arguing all five moments are equal, and Michael won at the IPS conference with his uh, one moment is more important than others. And I would never ever take Michael on as, in a debate. He has never ever been beaten. He could give him any topic, and he will win. So yeah, that that was a, a lesson for me. My ethos, my philosophy is yes, of course they're all important. Of course they are all opportunities for creation. But from a behavior, this is, and this is, which brings me back to what I said, you know, at, at the beginning, you know, if we look at this purely from a medical cross transmission perspective, then we we'll have to push the five moments. But we know that um, from from marketing research is that when people have too many options to choose, uh, there is a risk that they end up choosing nothing. <laughs> you know, or else choosing the one which is most convenient to them. And obviously for a healthcare worker, the most convenient moment is after a patient contact, because that is um, psychologically linked to self-protection. And it's therefore no surprise that every study in the world has shown that hand hygiene after patient contact is always higher than that before. You know? So, so uh, we looked at this more from a behavior perspective and from a behavior perspective, you know, as the, the famous Clinton message, you know, keep it simple. Um, and stupid. So in, yeah. in this case, because it's the economy, stupid. And in our case, it's the first moment, stupid, you know? Yeah. And it worked. And we can show that it worked. And, and behaviorally, and even from the feedback from the staff, you know, it, it became more easy for them to understand. I mean, uh, pushing hand hygiene, as, as both of you <laughs> I guess um, uh, we'll, we'll agree is not exactly the easiest uh, thing uh, in a hospital, but it, it, it made a difference and, and it did and we can show it. And, um, uh, we have the data to, to show mm. that, that even though we're focusing on the first moment, everything gets improved. Mm. And then mm. uh, at this time, uh, as you know, Martin, I'm, 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 I often come over, you know, I have lots of friends like you. Um, I love uh, seeing what's happening in other countries. And this was the time when the UK had, 
uh, at the end of the uh, in 2000, uh, when was that? When, when, when it was 2000 when the targets came in here, yeah. Exactly. Because, you know, a hand hygiene gets you so far. And I think you've explained why yeah. your hand, alcohol hand rub consumption chart goes up and then dips. So that's presumably you sorting out yeah. all the extraneous uses. But then you start going on to looking at prevention exactly. from a clinical point of view exactly. and, the, and device yeah. related. So let's talk about well, we we took a leaf out of out of um your book in the uk and one thing that really struck us was the the emphasis on root cause analysis uh so we thought we'd give it a go initially i was probably naive enough to think i could just copy and paste uh, the uk approaches we use the uk modus operandi you know, where the clinical team uh, runs the rca and then comes back to the IPC lead with, with recommendations and identifies areas where there could have been factors involved. And we did that and it was a complete failure because we didn't have the ownership you need for that. We didn't have the the organizational culture that you need to, to, to run that. So basically we flipped it on its head. We forgot the, the concept that infection control is not the remit of the infection control department. We accepted that this was, mm -hmm. in our case, you know, what we had to do. So we basically took it on completely. So we now run the RCAs from start to finish. Uh, we identify the cases from the lab reports. We go through the initial data. We identify if it's a relevant case that we should look into. And then we invite all the stakeholders to our place, we offer them coffee and get the ball rolling, but of course, making sure of two things. First of all, that it is not in any way intimidatory. Um, and secondly, that they have all the opportunities to, to provide their feedback and their clinical background. But we found that unless we drive the the program, it does not work, at least in our situation. Our culture. I like in the, in the paper, Michael, the way that you describe it. It's a really beautiful example of using data for action with the root cause analysis and, and I like the way you it, was it hard to bring everybody together for that root cause analysis so I can imagine initially yes. there would have been some hesitancy about that definitely definitely you know so um uh, two reasons first of all there was um uh, organizational memory of some let's say some attempts in two maybe I wouldn't say remote past, but more than a decade before, there had been an attempt by some departments to start morbidity and mortality meetings. And unfortunately, at that time, and here we're talking about the 1980s, so that's mm. as much as the memory persisted. Mm. You know, the, these m and meetings were then used by the then um, administration at the old hospital to actually institute disciplinary action against the, the um. doctors. So obviously, they were really expensive. <laughs> Um, and we address that primarily by getting our then CEO, you know, the, the different CEO, to actually make a clear declaration writing that all RCA findings will not be requested by the management other than the action points that were needed. You know, so that sort of assuaged the, mm -hmm. the, the apprehension a bit, but still there was quite a lot of resistance. And then I said, listen, guys, okay, so at the end of the day, if you don't want to come, you don't want to come, but we'll still have the RCA meeting and we'll still make the conclusions. And they said, no, you can't do that. Well, come and join us, you know. And then after a few months, people realized that this was genuinely a self improvement exercise. Um, uh, we have to persist, you know, and that's, that's, that's the key in behavior change. You will always find challenges at the beginning. But we did persist. Um, I'm a bit of a... Bulldog, I think Martin says sometimes. Uh, so, and you have to be that in infection prevention. I mean, you can't just give up at the, at the first hurdle mm -hmm. you find. Uh, and then it moved on. And, and it was really interesting, as, as we say in the paper, you know, because what the root cause analysis found was that our very high levels could actually be linked to basically three practices, you know, renal dialysis, peripheral IV cannulas, and center lines. And we started to get very clear indications of where our gaps in practices were. And this is the thing. You know, I, I always bring up the, the, my mother-in-law metaphor, you know, when your mother-in-law comes to your house and the first thing she says, oh, you have a cobweb over there, you know. I said, oh, my goodness, I pass that, that corridor, you know, 50 times a day and I haven't noticed that cobweb when she comes in. <laughs> this is what the use of RCA was, you know. I mean, we, we were there, we were 
doing uh, IPC rounds, etc. But we're missing most of these. You know, there were literally in our faces. So having the RCAs really um, focused our attention of where the areas are. And again, um, the other big utility we found was that these were sort of patient stories. So whereas in the past, there were areas which we had identified, well, for example, such as dressings, but the feedback was, well, yes, okay, we'll put it as part of the budget and then we'll see, and, uh, uh, but these are very expensive, you know, so uh, they're much more expensive than what we have at the moment and we have the budget for them. But telling them, listen, you know, this patient died because this dressing was inadequate and they couldn't do a proper observation from it. Then that made a very big difference. So again, you know, it's it's this this social marketing, it's this behavior change. Uh, and with the interventions, things like, for example, in renal dialysis, moving from the non-tunneled task cuts to initially to the firm cuts, you know, the ones you run under under the skin before the research, and then pushing for more rapid surgery for AV shunts. So this was really effective the introduction of the VIP score, the dressings, most importantly, focusing on the just-in-case cannulas, you know, those mm-hmm. that are inserted in, in A&D oh, yeah, and then yeah. have their no use whatsoever. Just in case, you know? yeah. And in the center lines, and in the center lines we, we use the IHI bundle, but as I say in the paper, with significant modifications. Mm. So, for example, we did not apply the Johns Hopkins ethos of having the nurse supervising the doctor because in our culture, that's not done. And the nurses were very clear from the start, you know, don't even think about asking us to stop an insertion. That's not my remit. I'm a nurse. There's a doctor. If you want to take it up with the doctor. So yeah, we had to find sort of compromises. So, OK, that doesn't work. Can we find something different? Well, I can tell you, listen, I'm really not too happy uh, assisting that doctor in, in the insertion, and I'm not willing to sign off the insertion chart uh, with him because I'm not all that happy in the way that he or she has filled it in. So using these, then we could identify which maybe intensivists needed a bit more discussion uh, about their, their insertion technique. And again, this was done from the the head of anesthesia, who is also in our case the head of ICU. So it's looking at at, at what others have done. Yeah. That's the way I feel. You know? so, so it, it, you always learn. Mm. So this is why I love other hospitals seeing what things are being done, and of course from from meetings. But you always have to adapt. Just on that point, Michael, I did that raised my interest when I saw that the nurses weren't prepared to supervise the medical staff with their with their insertions. So what did you replace that observation with? You had a, a checklist, was it, that they filled out? So as, as uh, very well aware, you know, in the, the IHI ethos is that the checklist has to be filled in completely and if you don't do everything, then a yeah. wrong insertion. And then the checklist is is supervised by by the nurse who stops uh, the insertion if, if the checklist is not followed. Uh, we tried to do that. We had, I think, about four or five focus groups with the ICU nurses um, as part of the implementation strategy because, thankfully, it was something that we had got a good budget from a, a new project that we were involved in, so this was our contribution. So, again, we use the checklist more of a an aid memoir, you know. It's it's more of a, uh, a, a, a guideline stroke SOP, Um, Mm -hmm. uh, but rather than using it on the whole, we sort of looked at this holistic approach, getting feedback more on the individual rather than on the insertion. So um, in our case, there is no way that a nurse, because of our power distance culture, that a nurse would stop a doctor in a doctor's procedure. It, it That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But you still find ways and means of going mm. about it. You know? I think probably what helped you is some of the aspects that were coming out of the RCA were actually structural and not 
classed as somebody's fault, like the you know the gap of time it takes to exactly. find a shunt. So so actually there there was a oh we can do something here and it's actually not my fault. It's not it's really not mm. personal. And sometimes you know and just leaving something in is sort of everybody's fault until it becomes a job of somebody to check every day. So I I, I think that that must have helped convince people actually there are things we can do here that aren't personal to me and no one's going to mm. uh, make me mm. hold my hand up. So yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the thing is, you know, I mean, to be fair, let's just say there were very few instances where we really had to intervene to sort of uh, bring in people who were persistently um, non-compliant, you know, because one, uh, most of these intensivists knew what Anamara Sebacteremia was back from St. Luke's and back from the beginning of the hospital. And, and I always say, you know, I don't believe that any healthcare worker goes into the hospital wanting to do harm for for patients. You know, I mean, whenever we do harm, most of it is either because of lack of awareness or for many other behavior factors. So, so knowing this, and and this was really again because we had the budget for it, we had the time for it, we were using it as a as a project implementation uh, exercise. So we met with the team, the whole ICU, about three times. So initially it was to raise awareness, again, following the Cotter principles, you know, raising urgency, this is a problem. Secondly is this is what we think we need to do, but where, where do you think we need to change our ideas? And then thirdly, okay, so we've seen the problem, we've talked to you, you've given us feedback, this is what therefore we have concluded. So, you know, let's go and do it. And it worked, you know, it worked. So, so I think it's it shows that even in high endemic areas, things uh, can 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 be improved. But we only uh, got as far. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. No, I was going to say, presumably over this time, you're feeding back some data that's showing things are improving because you have oh, yes, changes yes. every time. So, so did you notice any change in the mindset of the staff? Actually, if we do this, it does, and so therefore they're more willing to take on the next intervention. Very much so. Very much so. So, for example, you know, I mentioned the renal unit again. This was something which they were really, uh, you could feel that at the start, they almost personalized these cases that they were getting and they were seeing these these uh, unfortunate patients you know, dying from a MRSA bacteria. So again, once we started to reduce the, the cases and we started, for example, the renal unit to have a, a chart uh, or a, a sort of a notice board with the number of days uh, since their last MRSA bacteremia case, and then when we hit 500, we had a big do, you know, with a cake and the party. So it's it's what Cotter um, uh, defines as as short term wins, you know, mm. celebrating short term wins. Mm. And uh, again, I, I quote this whenever I do I do my lectures, you know, as Bill Gates says, you know, success um, makes people think they cannot fail, and and uh, this was really really important because. You know, these interventions added on the time uh, that the nurses had to do, you know, because doing things properly very often takes a little bit more time. So uh, convincing them that that time was worth five was, was really essential. And these these uh, successes then obviously not only reinforce that motivation, but it also reduce the pushback that you will get you know there are as you know from the theory of, of uh, innovation mm. diffusion that there are people who will never uh, mm. accept innovation never accept change you know? but having success and and publicizing that success so we used to issue six monthly updates this is, this is where we want to this is where we have reach would would then sort of uh, make those those active resistors less active mm. you know? <laughs> uh, so that's the second phase uh, but we only got to a certain stage you know because as you know in behavior it's it's never possible to get 100 percent compliance so we did improve but we only reached a certain level and then uh we said listen i think the issue here is that we are we, we have so much mrsa coming into hospital and i had a student uh, who had done a a, a study and at the time, about 13% of patients coming into Mater Dei were MRSA carriers. Mm. So with that level of carriers, 
said, listen, we have too much, too much background level of colonization. So let's, can we do something about it? So, I mean, this was the time, 2014, where people were moving to risk-based screening. But we sat down and we looked at this again from a behavior concept. We knew that it was not feasible for us for various reasons, you know. Whenever we tried risk assessments, it didn't work. What worked in our culture was centralization. So how could we centralize this? Basically, we said we'll go for universal screening on admission and we would do it all ourselves. So basically, I managed to recruit two care assistants and these individuals every morning go through the admission list of the previous day until eight o'clock in the morning, identify where the patients are. We go ourselves to the ward and we do the um, nasal and throat swabbing. And what we managed to do, because again, we had big um, uh, concerns from the laboratory, because again, the laboratory have issues with HR. They said, listen, we cannot cope with with, um, uh, 150 swabs a day uh, through our system. So we said, okay, so if we played them out on, on chromogenic media and... All we need from you is just to tell us whether there are colonies which are chromogenically indicative of MRSA. Would you be happy with that? And they said, yes. Okay, so that that was not going to increase our workload that much. So basically, this is what we do. You know, So we screen the patients at the bedside. The carers themselves plate out the Petri dish. They take it to the lab. They put it in the incubator. And then all the laboratory scientists need to do is just look at the plate if they are pink or blue or the very chromogenic medium they're using at the time, they just say, listen, we have chromogenic uh, growth that is indicative chromogenically of MRSA. And when we looked at this, uh, we found that, yes, there will be a few tough epidermidis that, that may mimic MRSA on the chromogenic medium, but these are few and far between. Uh, so we said, listen, for 5%. What we're gaining is much, much more than what we're losing from these five percent. We are deprivizing unnecessary, and it worked. You know, so over a period of four years, and again, that's another paper that we had published in in the Green Journal. Um, our MRSA rate, our MRSA colonization on admission dropped from thirteen percent to about three percent. Mm. Uh, and because most of these are what I call those revolving door patients, you know, so yeah. they leave the hospital today, having acquired the MRSA colonization during their week or whenever they've been there, they come back in a month or six weeks, you know, from the same issue. And now they're colonized. And then so we managed to, to cut that. And again, we saw a significant reduction in, in MRSA infections as a whole. And that's another publication that we did earlier and especially in the MRSA bacteria. So, yeah, I mean, this, this, this was, it was a journey. And I don't think, and if I have one take home, is that change doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. You know? um, uh, <laughs> it, it takes you 10 time. years to become exactly. an overnight success, doesn't it, Michael? That's the thing. <laughs> exactly. 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 I think that... Yeah, I mean... It, it, go on, go I was going to say, I think that's a really um, important point. Um, uh, that you make, Michael, that towards the end of the paper you describe, I think the lag period of about 18 months to see an effect, um, which just makes you wonder about all the research that's been done and, and the RCTs that, like, I think you might allude to that, that are done within 12 months, how much you can really take away from those when a lot of infection prevention is about behaviour and behaviour takes a long time to change. And, and 18 months is probably pretty quick also too with, with behaviour change in a... In a changing the culture of people so um it, it was a really interesting uh, I, I like the chart that where you demonstrate it's very remind me very much of the chart that martin i think you've probably presented a lot of the uk people have presented over the years of the declining rates of of, of, of um, mrsa with all the various interventions that have been required along the way but but that 18 month lag period i think is uh, is really important message to take home yeah, I mean, I normally use John Otter's chart, but I, I, I make to come on your point, which is a good one about the you know research is only done over a year. When people are doing research, they're probably more likely to do the intervention reliably because they know they're taking part in a research study often. Whereas here we're talking about a change in practice, which maybe they're not that convinced about anyway, and they don't, you know, it's not for a particular reason. So is that why sometimes research studies work very well? But then as soon as you stop the research 
people don't drift back to their normal practice or that that you know their research period's over we've got our paper somebody's got his phd and the unit haven't been convinced they they were never actually really involved they were just involved in a change in practice for a period and they haven't really got, got anything embedded mm. whereas this is more is us together isn't it michael this is our this is our data our hospital and that's why you're seeing a more likely uh, uptake of the interventions yeah, exactly no i mean uh, i'm always apprehensive of papers that show dramatic improvements uh, in a very short period of time um uh, it's 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 like i always again I, I i love metaphors as you know so it's like a weight loss you know when people lose weight very rapidly from a very intense program, it's fine, and that probably can be maintained for six months, twelve months, eighteen months, but then you will get fatigue. You know, so so I think what what our experience from this intervention was that slow and steady is much better than quick mm. and drastic. Uh, so we understood that in our culture, you know, this has been there, the, these practices have been ingrained, ingrained there for years. There is no way that you can change ingrained behavior that has persisted for decades in a year. You know? <laughs> and and uh, you, can, you can coerce and you can push and you can get people's, you know, enthusiasm for a short period of time, but once you then move on, then then um, things revert to mean. And to be honest, we saw that in real time, you know, due from the COVID, because obviously, like most other centers, you know, once COVID hit, practically all IPC was COVID, 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 and we saw. So we had to stop our MRSA screening, for example. Um, so that's another maybe uh, follow up that, that we'll do for this uh, for two years, because the the lab uh, was so much taken up by COVID testing. And we, we saw that we started to get cases starting to increase again. So now we've gone back to where we were. And, and paradoxically, you know, again, with COVID, um, and we've talked about this, Martin, you know, what we've seen was that our hand hygiene actually um, deteriorated, ironically. Uh, and one of the reasons which I'm, I'm pretty well convinced is because we made so much emphasis on gloves yeah. uh, at the beginning of COVID. Oh, gloves, 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 gloves. That now the 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 issue is we have to wean them off gloves. They they, they all they think about are gloves. So previously we had managed to reduce um, glove uh, misuse or glove unnecessary use, um, uh, and it's, it's gone back up. Like and again, you I speak to to, to people at, uh, at meetings, and it's uh, it's a pretty. Um, uh, common experience, you know. So again, it's all about behaviour. Uh, Just finally, Michael, I wanted to. I'll oh, go on. No, no, I was going to say. I think the 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 other thing I really like about what you've described in the paper, Michael, is it's almost like a co-design um, intervention that you've that you've been successful with here because you've engaged with the healthcare workers and helped and asked them and worked with them to come up with the interventions. And I think that's a really important point in infection prevention as well because. Your point about, you know, um, you can't just pick up a study's interventions and apply it into your own workplace because there's going to be differences and it might not always work. And that's a really important point out of this paper is that uh, some beautiful studies around, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in your in your environment. We always say that that um, uh, infection prevention is often cost neutral or cost beneficial. And it may be the case, you know, economically, but more often than not, what we ask from our colleagues will increase their workload, will increase their time. So it was all about trying to see how we can minimize that as possible, as much as possible. So, for example, making sure that the alcohol is there at the bedside rather than having to get them, uh, making sure that uh, the screening is done centrally, you know, so it, it didn't add any load on the ward and we minimize the load on the lab from this very customized protocol, you know. So I think it's something that, and, and whenever we did ask something from the ward, again, the key was that we had managed to sort of instill a level of urgency. Mm. And, and this is what... Uh, 
Potter always says, and I and, and something that I always believe in, you know, unless you manage to instill urgency and appreciation of the need to change, then you can do a hundred change initiatives and it's very unlikely they're going to succeed. You know, so. But the urgency was really useful for us. Yeah, I think it's interesting when we think oh, this is going to add time to people's work. Now, sometimes it really does because we're asking them to do a new task. Yeah. Sometimes we're actually asking them to do what they should have been trained to do in the first place. So therefore, because they've shortcut it, mm -hmm. it's going to be seen as this is going to add time rather than actually if you'd have done what you're supposed to be doing all along. It wouldn't add any time at all. And now, now finally, Michael, I just want to mention that many of the interventions, like the um, increase in hand hygiene and all of the device-related interventions, will be applicable to other organisms, whereas the screening won't be because that's specific for MRSA. So did you see any impact on sensitive staph aureus infections, bloodstream infections during this period oh, as yes, well? Yes, so, so again, we showed this in the, in the paper very briefly. So as, as you know, Martin, um, we use change point analysis. So basically, I'm... I had a friend of mine who's a very nice statistician, good statistician. and uh, he, they can nowadays, you know, look at the trends and identify where in the trends there were significant drops um, in in incidence. So, in terms of MRSA, all three, um, all three interventions actually show highly significant change point um, dips. But in the case of MSSA, the hand hygiene um, did not make a difference. Yeah. The screening obviously did not make a difference. But the line interventions did. And again, this mm. makes sense, you know, because yeah. most of the patients in the ward, you know, are colonized by MSSA, 30% if not more. So screening won't work. And hygiene, well, yes, but they're already colonized coming in. So it's 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 difficult there in terms of cross-submission. But if you're, you're practicing lines properly, then the route of um, transmission uh, the portal of entry is going to be addressed. And this is what we teach our uh, undergraduates. You know, if you break one chain in the portal of entry and in the, sorry, in the chain of infection, in this case, the portal of entry, then you should eliminate the infection. And our data uh, supports that. Well, that's been fascinating. I mean, we could talk forever, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there's lots of discussion still to be had in this one, don't you? Yeah, yeah the, there's, a, there's a, so much in this paper. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned and... Uh, um, thank you for mm. writing it up, Michael. It's really, really well written and very clear and, and great to read. And shows you that patience, as ever, is a virtue. And perhaps to warn people, we're going to start this, but don't expect an impact quickly. Because sometimes if you are going to ask for management support for something, if it doesn't happen soon, they may pull the plug on you. Whereas this is going to show you that actually if you persevere, you, you can get there. Because 90% plus reduction in MRSA bloodstream infection over a 10-year period, but it's still a 90% reduction, is a fantastic achievement. Yeah. And the whole team deserves, and the whole hospital deserves credit for that, I think. So thanks very much for joining us, Michael, to talk about this. And I hope people will enjoy reading the paper. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Great. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Phil, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Okay, everybody, we'll see you again on another edition of Infection Control Matters. Thanks for joining us.